Welcome to the 21st Century Physio Podcast. I've got a very exciting guest today. I've got Liam Knight all the way from North Carolina. So probably the opposite side of the world to where I'm sitting right now. Pretty much the opposite time zone. Uh, and Leon is massive in physiotherapy. He's got a great following uh, through social platforms. Uh, and for someone who's only been out as a physiotherapist for a limited you know, amount of time, has really made a big uh, impact on the profession. I'm really looking forward to, you know, hear how he's gone about making this uh, impact, but also, you know, some of the massive things he's uh, going to do in the future because he's had a massive impact today. So welcome, Leon, to the podcast. Hey, thank you for having me. Um, I, I, as soon as you gave me the opportunity, I said, let's do it. I don't get invited to many podcasts, so um, I guess it's the, the curse of having your own. People think you don't want to go on theirs, but... Thanks for inviting me. I'm looking forward to it. No, thank you. So your podcast, Two Docs with Two Cents, love the title. Thank you. <laughs> How do you, uh, I guess, start off the bat? That's obviously with your lovely wife. Yes. Yeah. So um, let me tell you, we have, with me starting my own practice, we've been very busy, right? And so I've kind of slipped up in not being um, given the direct one-on-one -on -one time and the quality time, so to speak. And so I knew I wanted to do a podcast and I hadn't figured out who I wanted to be my guest or not guest, but my co-host. And so I told her, you know what, this is a great time for us to spend quality time. And <laughs> why, don't we just create, why don't we just create our own podcast? And uh, she's like, eh, that's a stretch. Cause she knew that I needed her to be the one that take care of the ones and twos, like the recording, the editing. She knew it was a more of a project, but uh, she hopped on and we've enjoyed it ever since. It is fun. That's fantastic. I, know. I love, love listening to it. There's, you get some awesome guests on there. So if you haven't checked it out, I highly recommend you go and have a listen to Leon's podcast. But I guess on that note, how do you find having a partner who's also a physical therapist? I think it's been helpful with the um, transition for me to start my own practice. Yeah. And um, having, with her having the, the background information and knowledge, I can run ideas off her. And then also, I, I would think someone would get burnt out very quickly, another part, like a, a partner, if they were not a physical therapist, because that's all I do. This is all I talk about. I eat, breathe, sleep it. And so um, she can tell me to shut up and stop and whatever the case may be. But <laughs> the fact that she understands what I'm saying, it's, it makes it easier for us to kind of have that bond. Definitely. So did you guys meet at school or... We met in school, like I, I tell the story, we uh, in the same graduating class. And I would say for the first six months, we were just, you know, classmates and, and had very little interaction. But it wasn't until, um, I want to say kinesiology class where we did palpation. She was like my first uh, lab partner. And uh, still nothing, no sparks flew. But ultimately what happened, I asked her, hey, after we decided to study together one time on a Friday, you like pizza? I'm going out for pizza. I go out every Friday. <laughs> and ever since then, we've been, you know, that's the, that's the routine, pizza on Fridays. But I will admit, ever since we started working, uh, started dating, I should say, uh, my grades went up. Yeah, fantastic. My grades went up. So, you know, my GPA was higher ever since we started. <laughs> It's, uh, it's, it's very common, you know, I can't say how many people in the industry do have partners, you know, in a similar profession. Yeah. And it's, uh, no, it's good to hear that. Uh, how about you, know, you? Positive. No, so she's, she's actually very different. So she's, she's in retail. So okay. she, uh, yeah, she does a lot of management stuff. So, you know, I learn a lot from her around big business though, which is, um, you know, I think it helps to give me some skills to bring into the physiotherapy industry. Uh, I guess you sort of, you know, have got some of those skills as well, given you're a bit of a late bloomer when it comes to physiotherapy. Yeah, I took the long, I took the long road. Um, so I went the long, inefficient, most expensive road. Okay. <laughs> so I, uh, undergraduate degree was in business management and looking back at that, which business or whose business would I be managing right out of school? This is, it's the most, I think, ridiculous concentration you can have as an undergrad. Wait till you take your MBA in order to be like a business management type of, uh, uh, like you pursue that concentration. So um, ultimately I started in some entry level position and was in sales and kind of finance. And it wasn't until uh, around 2009, 2000, I would say 2007, 2008, where I started to realize that I wasn't enjoying what I was doing. Yep. And um, I didn't think I was getting the, my, my traits or my um, strong points, I would say, weren't being 
utilize. And for that very reason, I was like, well, let me at least do personal training on the side. Um, I was doing it part time after my full time job. And then um, I started liking that more than my full time job. And I said, well, this would be great if I can do this as a full time career. But personal training for me, when I was at the YMCA, wasn't making enough in order to pay the bills. So uh, I still did it for a little while, but it wasn't until I had a couple of clients who were, I would say, for the most part, injured, but still wanted to have, still wanted to reach certain goals, whether it was to lose weight, to build muscle. And it wasn't until then it dawned on me that I had a limited knowledge base to, to take them to the next level. And so I tried to figure out what was that next level. And when you consider pain and you bring pain and limitations into the equation, then physical therapy was kind of the realm that I decided to pursue. Fantastic. And so do you think that background in sort of business and sales has helped you going into uh, your physical therapy? I think so. Uh, for many reasons. One, it always keeps me practical, right? So I always, when I'm making decisions, whether it is for continuing education, whether it's for um, considering a study, how that relates to me and my practice, um, I'm always looking at the practicality in it as opposed to the, the abstract clinician who's like, oh man, pie in the sky kind of talk, pie in the sky kind of thoughts. Um, it allows me to always say, okay, what's, let's try to make it as black and white as possible, even though it's some gray area. So therefore I can be the most effective and efficient. And um, I think that mindset has helped me, but also I think it's helped me in learning how, teaching me how to talk to clients, knowing what they need, or patients, I should say. Um, know, knowing that creating an experience, creating a, a rapport is really the most important part of the subjective, not necessarily what their story is. And that has helped me in terms of my outcomes as well as growth as a clinician. Fantastic. More than anything, I'll be honest with you, more than anything. Yeah. And so you obviously graduated. You, uh, you went pretty quickly into your own, started your own um, practice, uh, which is becoming more and more common these days. You know, why did you decide to go out straight into your own practice? What, are you saying why didn't I or why I did know, I? Why, why did you? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, I know because I know a couple of clinicians that when they graduate now, they actually are trying to start their own practice right offhand. I didn't yeah. have the uh, skill set, at least I didn't think so, to do that right after. But um, I started my practice one year after being out, being uh, one year after graduating in. I just knew that was the ultimate goal when I first started my own, um, started working for someone, but I didn't know it would come that soon. But it's not until you either feel that you're in the wrong fit or environment and you start to learn that there's other avenues that are possible uh, for you to pursue. And I didn't know that while I was in school, the cash-based models, I didn't hear much about it. Um, while in school. So I didn't know that was an option because if I did, I knew I would have thought that, okay, I can maybe do it in six months, you know, as opposed to a year, but I still think a year is pretty quick. Um, it, I, I didn't enjoy the, the model of seeing so many people an hour and um, I wasn't getting any mentorship while there. Yep. And then lastly, I just thought that they didn't have an open mind to some of the I don't, I don't want to say philosophies I have, but open mind to some of the interests that I had, whether it was like the FMS or certain things. It was more of a system, follow the system. This We've been doing this for a while. We've gotten results and so forth. But uh, towards the end, right before I moved out, I realized that, that the results and the protocol only worked for like 80% of the patients. And when I saw that the rigidity was there, even though the 20% weren't getting better, I said, there's got to be a better way. And, you know, what, what, if everybody's doing the same thing and the 20% is not getting better, then we're just saying we're content with uh, where we are, content with our protocol, and we're just not going to be able to help 20%. And I was yeah. thinking, it's, it's, that's, not, that's not acceptable. So um, that's what really, really started to push me towards, okay, there's got, there, I'm leaving patients on the table in terms of those that can be getting better. And what can I do in order to provide a better service? So I think that's what led me to it. And then seeking the knowledge as well as the, um, the mentorship to get 
the 20%, because really that's all I see now, the 20%. <laughs> I go from, I don't get, a, I don't get an ankle sprain. Yep. You know, like I don't get one, any layups, so yep. to speak, easy patients that get better if you just, you know, smile and nod. I get the 20% that's been everywhere, um, yep. chronic, and um, haven't had results. So um, it's, it's more challenging, but it's fun and rewarding too. Yeah, I love you. You mentioned mentorship. What's been critical for you, sort of, um, you know, building your skills and bridging that gap from, you know, that first year out of uh, out of school? Yeah, so I've had, so I have different mentors. All are uh, in this have the same interests and principles that I do, and I think that's key. It doesn't matter what yours are. Just find someone that has depth of not a certain depth of knowledge in those areas, and um, pick their brain. Go shadow them. I would shadow people in the Charlotte area that could be rivals, right? Like they, they were nice enough to let me shadow. And um, I, I would tell anybody, just don't, don't stop if you can't find someone right yeah. away. Keep pursuing, reaching out to people, whether it's on social media or in person, um, you know, giving people a call because um, there's so much out there that you can learn. And people are willing to share, but you have to show an eagerness and a willingness to learn. And more importantly, I think you have to go in with a certain amount of humility because if you go in with, I know a certain amount, I just need you to add a little bit here and it will sprinkle a little bit there. Then it, it rubs people the wrong way. And I think you'll limit how much you can gain and absorb from that pace, that person that you're trying to get mentorship from. Yep. No, I think that's a really, really good point. If you're not open to, you know, everything and lots of new different things, you're going to miss out on some gold along the way. And you can always learn from, from something, from, you can learn something from everyone, I say. So it um, doesn't matter whether it is a, you know, physical therapist or whether it's another health professional or another business professional, as you sort of mentioned before, sort of working with my partner. So I think that's a really, um, you know, awesome point. So you mentioned cash-based business. So in Australia, you know, for the people down under here, that's probably not as much a thing. All businesses, I guess, would be termed cash-based. But look, what is the model in the States? And, you know, what does a cash-based model look like compared to the normal model? Yeah, so the normal models could be insurance-based where um, a patient has an insurance in which they pay into, they have a premium every month. And that premium basically says, um, okay, you can go to a provider, we're gonna, you have a copay, and then you have a certain proportion in which you have to pay that we may not pay. So if we pay 70%, you're responsible for the 30% plus your copay. Yeah. So ultimately people can, they can have copays between 20 and 40 bucks, or maybe sometimes 50 bucks. And then uh, the res remaining portion of a session could leave them with another 30 bucks that they have to pay. So in any given session can be about $80 if they haven't reached a deductible. Yeah. Whereas the cash-based model um, says, okay, well, let's take out insurance, the middleman, which if the middleman is included, is going to dictate my treatment time with you, which will affect my quality time with you in terms of what I can put, uh, what, what kind of, to me, the treatment time doesn't always mean hands-on time. It just means my ability to assess, reassess, um, and, and continue to make um, changes along the way that are, to me, vital each time that you have someone in front of you as opposed to saying, okay, yeah, I wish I can get to that, but I'm going to have to wait till next week because I don't have the time to see you and, the same, and another person at the same time. So we'll get to that next week. But what that does is it pushes their recovery and their return to whatever it is that they're trying to get back to another week. Right. So um, the cash based model says, you know what, we're not going to let insurance dictate that because of the, out the reimbursement that they're going to give. So we're going to say, I'm going to treat you for the entire hour one on one where you may only get 15 minutes if you go to someone that's in, in network or paying with insurance, because if they are accepting your insurance, more than likely they're not getting a certain they're not getting but they're only getting a certain amount, a set rate. And that set rate, when they have overhead, multiple therapists, um, staff, medical, you know, staff up front, billing companies, it ends up being a small amount. So therefore they have to, pay, they have to see Steven at nine o'clock, Andrew at 9.15 or 9.30. They 
they have to see Walton at 9.45 or, <laughs> or at 10 o'clock. And they, they just have to pack the schedule so they don't have as much time as they need in order to really get the results uh, that they want. Cash base is going to take that out and say, Stephen, you come in at 9 o'clock, it's me and you till 10 o'clock. There's not gonna, I'm not going to throw you on a bike if you don't need the bike as a warm-up. I'm not going to put any ice or heat on you. I'm going to say, okay, what do we have? Let me assess you, reassess, figure out which exercises are the most beneficial and effective for you. I'm not going to give you a list of exercises that anybody will benefit from, but they're not necessarily the, the correct exercise or dosage that you need. Um, so we're not going to take the cookie cutter approach out. And I'm going to see you in one week, okay? Because I'm going to give you time to get better at the drills that are techniques that I gave you. And um, so I'm going to empower you to get this done. You come back, we progress you, we move on because we're a week, we're a week away, we're a week out. So that means that a week of healing, a week of improving whatever motor skill that we're trying to learn. Um, and we keep moving on. So uh, instead of 15 minutes with them, I get a chance to spend 60. So 15 times four sessions it takes in order for you to put 60 minutes of direct time with the patient in an insurance model compared to cash-based model. Yeah. And, and how do you go about sort of building that business and, and marketing that to people? Because it's obviously different to what they're traditionally used to. Yeah. I think that's the most challenging. If anyone was to ask me, what, what is ca- like, why is cash-based, uh, what's the biggest challenge that you have? I think is constantly getting new patients because uh, ultimately if you're with, if you're in a cash-based model, they should be getting better faster, right? Or they at least should, <laughs> I mean, if, if, I, if, I'm, if my outcomes are the same as Stevens in an insurance-based model, and then there's, I, there's no cash-based model. <laughs> <laughs> like, technically, there's no reason why someone would pay out of pocket to get the same results at the same amount in the same amount of time in like, an insurance-based model. So, I see people six to eight sessions as opposed to six to eight weeks, time, two times a week. Yeah. Um, so that's going to cut it down. And then um, for that reason, I'm gonna constantly need new patients. And the way we try to get new patients is directly market to the specific patient population that you are trying to target. So for me, it's going to be the active um, patient who really puts a high value on their quality of life and or their performance in which in whatever recreation activity be that is a passion of theirs. I'm not going to be my patient population or my my uh, target market is not going to be Sandra who was referred to physical therapy by her primary care physician who is looking to pay only a copay because she thinks all physical therapy is the same. Hasn't been to somewhere where she didn't get results and had an unpleasurable, un, unpleasant experience. So that won't be my, cli- my clientele. That's the 80% that we talked about before we got on here, where as the 20% are those that is Mary, who's like, I've been to Steven, I've been to Andrew, I've been to Blake, I've been to Sarah and, I feel like I, I'm always doing exercises in the corner, the same ones, they're not listening to me, and I still have this chronic hamstring issue. Leon, I'm paying out of pocket to see you. Let's get this done. That, those are the patients that I, that I see. Fantastic. A lot, lot more rewarding to work with, definitely. Yeah, because they're, 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 they're going to be the ones who are motivated. Yeah. Right? They're coming to me. They're paying out, you pay out of pocket, you're going to be motivated to do those exercises when you go home. Makes a big difference, doesn't it? Yes. And so you've obviously got your key avatars that you sort of look to, you know, attract Mary, I think is, uh, you know, you mentioned. <laughs> um, so wh- wh- where do you go about attracting these people? How do you go about, um, you know, marketing to them? Is it online? Is it, you know, through different networks? Um, what's, what's your process over there? I think the most, uh, I, so a mentor of mine that I work with uh, made a very good point. He said that, you, everyone thinks they need more clients or more patients, but they never consider the fact that they have enough patients, but the patients that they have, they haven't become great patients. You haven't turned them into great patients and great patients are patients that says, you know, Steven is great. You need to go see him and you tell 10 other people, right? Or, you know, and vice versa. So um, the, the problem 
so my ultimate goal is always to start with the movement solutions family by saying, okay, you know, is there someone that in your family or a friend of yours that I can help send, you know, just let them know uh, or send them as a referral or I'd be more than happy to help them. That's usually what I say. I'll be more than happy to help them. Tell them that I do um, consultations at no charge just to get acquainted and see if there's something that I can help them with. Um, so referral system is really big. Word of mouth is very big. And then um, social media for a certain demographic. So the, the 25 to 34 or, you know, demographic is the, are the ones that are going to be on social media the most. And yeah. so they're going to be your active looking for a different type of physical therapy, not your bands and not your uh, ankle weight exercises. Right. Yeah. So they're, they're looking for a certain advanced progression of exercises. And, and that's what I usually put on Instagram and I try to keep it practical, but um, they, I would say once a week or once every two weeks, I get people from this, I get a new patient from Instagram. Well, tell me about Instagram. You obviously, uh, you know, have gone fully in there. You've built an amazing following. I think over 160,000 followers around the world now. What mm -hmm. uh, what's made you sort of decide, you know, this is something that I want to do or is it just something that naturally evolved? Did you go in with a plan or? Oh, so in the beginning, I didn't go in with a plan. I, um, I just figured, so I was still working for another company uh, when I, when I started my Instagram in 2016, it was January, but I, I had no focus. Um, my name was different. And, and so it wasn't until I left that company, I became more serious about the message that I wanted to promote because I, I figured if, in this digital world, it, you, you're at, out of sight, out of mind. So, you, you know, if social media is a free marketing tool free advertising tool. I have to take advantage of this. And um, so I, I just slowly but surely started changing my message and my focus to more of a health and fitness as well as a different spin of physical, physical therapy. And uh, I never forget talking to a couple guys who um, had large phones at the time and still do about advice. And they said, we just got to be consistent. So I was, I was posting three times a day in the beginning. A day you know um and then i started gain, gaining some traction i think it's a little bit harder now because it's a little bit more saturated with clinicians out there but um i remember it was me and uh teddy strength coach therapy for a while and we would talk have conversations and i tell people this all the time it was in 2000 maybe january or february 2017 and we were having a conversation on the phone he had about 40 about 4200 and i had about 2500 and i said we got to change i mean we got to keep pushing we got to change the game and we're like that new wave of pts you got great cook you got all these people that are they're big but they use different platforms such as like blogs and they use other things and i said well social media is, is our animal we can take it and take the reins of it he said yeah let's do it let's do it we're gonna do it this guy blows up. <laughs> like, I thought I had growth. He just ended up growing so quickly, but um, it was all due to his consistency and the type of content that you put out. So I was like, well, I'm just going to keep putting out my content with a certain spin on it. And it just kind of grew. People follow me either for the creativity or practicality. They don't, I mean, it's just, you know, I have my own lane, I should say. I don't really go into too much of the, the bantering back and forth. Yeah. So what do you find is the best type of content to share? What do you get the best engagement with? I would say, I'm going to be honest with you, the simple stuff. So like the, uh, when I do the side by side post of daily activities and, and the gym activities, how they carry over, like those get the most engagement because they, again, are very um, they're easy to see and more practical as opposed to, if I was to do some single leg pistol squat into a single leg RDL without touching my foot on the floor, they're going to be like, Oh, that's great showing off. But how does that help me? Or how does that, you know, get me excited about PT or even seek help? Yeah. Cause they're thinking I can't do that. Then he's out, you know, he's not necessarily the right fit for me. So what, what do you think is the, you know, the future, I guess, of social media in physical therapy? 
you know, where, where do you see it fitting and see it evolving? I, I, I think um, the way – I'm going to be honest with you, and I'm a little concerned. I think it's, it's probably peaked. I know you're like, wait, really? No, I, I really think it has peaked. And, and what I mean by that is I just know for me, when I go on my feed sometimes, I, if I see something like physical therapy, I just – I swipe up, it's like not, not a, yeah, it, yeah, because it's 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 really oversaturated now. Yeah. I think um, it has peaked in the sense of how many different exercises can Steven do that I haven't seen, or that if I was to put my own spin it, it still looks the same, right? So um, I think the fact that it's peaked doesn't mean it's a a true con. It's just a matter because I do think it's great content out there, and it's great content for students to see different types of exercises and almost like a, um, a supplement to what they're receiving in school. Because of you and I know in school, it's just to, you got to pass the board. So they're going to get you to pass the boards, but all that extra fancy, all that good stuff um, that we learn outside of school is not going to be, they're going to say, save that for out of school. So people are getting introduced to that on social media, learning articles, also seeing um, different products such as yours, uh, your mat assessment. I mean, I think it's all good, but ultimately I think it's peaked and it, it will only, I think it's just, it'll kind of level out a little bit because people will get tired of it, especially with more people entering and trying to create names and sell products. It comes a little bit too like pushy in that sense. Yeah, no, no, I def- definitely agree with you there. I think you've got to you know, start doing something a little bit different, but there is only so much information people can take in and we're just bombarded these days with, um, with yeah. information. So now I was, I was interested in listening to one of your podcasts the other day. You said, you know, you're starting to get a bit smarter with what you do. You start, you know, you've got a bit of a plan. It's not as hectic. Uh, you know, the first few years you mentioned were a bit of a grind. Uh, so, so, so what's in store for you going forward? Yeah, so... My ultimate goal, and uh, I haven't really um, discussed this in like a public setting, but my ultimate goal is to, to, to grow my business in a way that I can hire another clinician and, and move into a standalone, where, where it's a storefront and kind of build exactly what I want in terms of um, the type of equipment, the spacing, and then being able to offer a certain environment, you know, present a certain environment and atmosphere for the, the patients who are looking for a certain service. So um, that is my great, that is my big time goal. And then I think also I want to some way, somehow help clinicians become better clinicians. And I think the best way to do that, um, or at least I think one of my strengths are assessing or evaluating patients. And um, I think when I came out of school, I wasn't as confident with evaluations. I thought, that if you would have put, like from, if, if you told me I had a knee patient, I still didn't feel comfortable, you know, with this, someone that had a knee injury or was coming in with some form of knee pathology. And I think if I had a system in place or had um, the versatility in, a, in a, an assessment, I would have been more, um, prepared or feel, felt more confident. And that wasn't until I, um, I took the SFMA course. I, I think the SFMA course really helped me with the principles, the critical thinking, and a system. Now, granted, the system definitely has some things in where um, I filled in some, some of the gray areas or holes, but it really got me thinking of a system, okay? Can they do it active? No. Uh, can they do a passive? And do they have it passively? Yes. Okay. Well then, you know, l- let's take out gravity and then, and see if they can still do it. Like there, there were different uh, steps that made me think about every joint that way. And then I was able to branch out and add layers to it. But um, I, th- I think assessment is really key. And so I would love to eventually teach a course about assessment. Well, it fits my bias pretty nicely. So <laughs> I think uh, a good assessment sets up a great uh, treatment and training plan. So I think, uh, yeah, it does. I love, love that philosophy there. Well, why do you think this stuff isn't taught at university? Well, for one, I don't think they've done a, I don't think they've done a good, well, I don't think they've figured out. That's a great question. Let me, let me step back and say, okay, until it becomes part of the board exam, it won't be in, yeah. in the universities because 
there in in universe if anything on the board exam will be covered in the curriculum and the fact that it like your your assessment of uh, your your different tests on the mat assessment um, I think are really cool ways to analyze movement objectively but until that is like you know something that is going to be on the boards it's not going to be on there but clinicians are missing that so such as myself when I got out of school I'm like I don't really know how to do a return to sport you know like I'm gonna have to google that and I was just in school like why am I googling something or looking at a reason you know google scholar for a research article that you know I'm gonna just steal their protocol not necessarily have the back in the backing or the critical thinking as to why I'm using it and when I should really use it but um I think the curriculum has to change in order for us to be considered more of specialists. Right now, I know we're entry levels and I guess that's what they want us to be, but in order for us to be considered like specialists at movement analysis, assessing and and progressing movement and changing it, um, we're gonna have to have those type of measures, those type of, um, that type of education. And whether it's a residency, residency that's added on to our um, curriculum, more money, more uh, more time, I don't know, but there's something that needs to be um, that I think needs to be implemented in order for us to kind of get to that next level. Yeah. No. I think you sort of touched on this a, a little bit, but where do you see the profession in 10 years time? I think we'll be better off for sure. I think we're trending in the right direction. Um, like the, the the research is helping us for sure um to to change some of our thought process i think people need to be careful with the latest research throwing out the baby with the bath water that was the foundation (laughs) years ago but um i think the research is allowing us to to look at um patients presentations in a whole nother uh, i think a whole nother light or underneath a whole nother different light as opposed to saying okay it's always biomedical or biomechanics that's causing pain or the reason why this person is having this chronic issue is because like, I think now we're learning these, I think the BPS model has really kind of brought the uh, thought process to the forefront where you're like, okay, well, there's multiple factors, treat the patient as a human being. Um, Along with that, I, I, I don't want them, I don't want people to, completely kick out the biomechanics because I think the biomechanics is how we really evaluate and assess movement, right? Like I can't, I can't just completely throw that away, but in 10 years, I can see us really having a better, um, a better understanding as well as integration of both, like how to treat the patient as a human being where you mentally uh, mentally can, um, mentally can, I think change their thought process, get them, in, encourage them, empower them about taking advantage, not taking advantage, but taking um, their health seriously as well as considering, okay, well, I can do this. I am resilient. I can just, this is what I need to do. I just need to follow these steps. And then we have to have those steps in place, whether it's a mad assessment, whether it is um, SFMA or why, whatever the case may be that we can build their confidence saying, Hey, I passed these. I should be in a better place or position. Like there just has to be better processes in place in order for us to get the credit that we deserve. And that is coming as as we continue to get the research going. Fantastic. And so obviously you're looking to build your business over the next, you know, five to 10 years, you're going to need some team on board. You mentioned you're sort of looking to get your first team member in. What are you going to be looking for in that in that person that you bring on board? Someone better than I am. Yeah. <laughs> because in all seriousness, no, I'm just looking for someone that who who really has a passion for helping others. I know that sounds cliche, but I'm talking about where the patient's goals are really their goals. Like they are truly invested. Um, they they are selfless in a sense where if they have a certain way that they treat and the patient doesn't respond well to that, they don't combat that. They find a way to meet middle, you know, 
on some metal, on some form of middle ground, and um, they 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 understand that it's it's bigger than just like what you know. I was telling someone earlier today. Um, I said it's really not about the X's and O's. You know, it's about the experience that you create for the ordinary Joes, right? Like, that's really what it is. Like, people, people get so caught up in, I got to learn the next skill, the new skill, this and that. I don't want a therapist that only is considered, only looking to stack up their certificates, right? I want someone to say, okay, I want to create an experience where even if the patient doesn't get better, they still see me as the gatekeeper because I refer them out to the right person, right? Or anytime that I have an issue, it can be with my, uh, my eyebrows. They, they still consider me, you know, like, like I, I just want that to be the case as opposed to, oh, uh, you know, it's all about, you know, just if they didn't get better, it's not my fault. You know, I did what I was supposed to do. No, it's, hey, we, we took a, we took one for the team. We took a loss. We took an L. And, and what was wrong about, what, what did we do wrong? How can we do it better? And then how can we, um, so how can we learn from that? And then next time we'll be prepared. But it's always self-reflection. And I think that's the kind of person I would be looking for. Yeah, no, I, th- I think that'll probably be one of your answers to this next question, I think, which is what are some take homes from today that you can, uh, you can give people? What are maybe the top three ways that, you know, physical therapists can help to bring their practice into the 21st century and succeed in the future? Yeah, I think it's going to have to be service, service, service. Like you have to be the ultimate um, person who, you, you, so you're, you're, your thought process can't be, I, I want to be the best, I don't know, I want to have the best skills, so to speak. Like, you, I, there are people more skilled than I am. I know that. And they always will be someone better than you, right? So my, I, I shouldn't get pumped up or my goal shouldn't be, like, to get every skill in the book, right, or every certification. I think going forward, we have to say, okay, service over everything. The, the type of service that we provide from the experience so they, they feel comfortable, welcome, feel comfortable opening up to you so that you get a full subjective, right? And then you're, act, you're doing active listening, right? Not just saying, okay, can't wait to get to the subjective because I, I, I got to be tested. I got to take it through. That's going to tell me the real objective stuff. No, it's not like that. Subjective and objective are the key. And uh, they dictate where you go. To me, the subjective is, is extremely important because it dictates where you go in your evaluation. If you start your evaluation at the same place every time, then you're, you're not listening to the subjective. <laughs> I just think about that. If, it, if, it's the same, if it's two different patients and you still say, I'm going to start here. You start, no, to me, you're not really listening. So if we, if we become obsessed with providing the service as well as um, fine tuning our skill set, but that skill set is in, is to enhance the service we can provide. Um, I didn't learn that until um, I really got on my own because I was just taking so I took so many courses when I, in the first year, and I was just trying to get better, better, better because I wasn't getting receiving any mentorship. But it wasn't coming back full circle to the service I was providing. Like it, it didn't. I didn't still connect well enough. Like I still was just trying to throw these new modalities that I learned or new techniques that I learned. But I, in order for us to make the biggest difference going forward as a profession, we have to say, okay, the research, the continuing education courses, they only enhance the service that we provide. And if we do that, then that means the patient is taken care of first, then the outcomes are going to improve. Their, um, their, um, their review or their the thought of physical therapy changes. And then that's going to be a trickle down effect to the physicians that say, okay, well, maybe they do need physical therapy after um, certain joint replacements now, because now people are getting better as opposed to now saying for knee replacements, they don't really need any or, or hip or, you know, back. We don't want them touching them. Like, I think that is going to have to, we're going to have to provide a better service for things like that to change. Definitely. No, I think there's some awesome points. Thank you very much for joining us today, Leon. If the p- listeners want to find out a bit more about you, where do they find you? 
Yeah, so uh, my Instagram handle is the performance doc, all one word. And then in regards to my podcast, you mentioned it earlier, my podcast is two docs with two cents. And that's the number two docs, number two <laughs> cents. And then um, if you have any questions or want to reach out, feel free to, um, if you go on my Instagram handle, the email there is perfect. You can uh, look at my website as well as give me or send me an email that way as well. Some great resources, really practical information, as you said, that you can start to, you know, take away and start to make some meaningful changes, uh, you know, to your practice. So I highly recommend those. Thank you very much for your time today, Leon. Stephen, thank you for having me. I look forward to collaborating soon. Um, I appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks, Leon. All right. Take care.